thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you for all choosing not to follow the money. Um, we figured we'd end up with a fairly uh, intimate intimate group here um, by comparison with that with that larger group. So it's great to see a bunch of you here. Um, and the idea was to start with a conversation. Um, um, as many of you will know, I've been a person who's talked a lot about the principles under which organisations should operate. Um, and you're now involved in a project which is moving from a project to try to be an infrastructure. Um, so it felt appropriate and reasonable to have my own feet held to the fire um, over what we were doing. Um, and yeah, and no better person to do that than I thought Catherine Skinner, um, who's also been involved in writing up um, several of these principles. So I will, I guess, hand over to Catherine to, to start the interrogation and then <laughs> you know, bring you in for a conversation. Yeah, with this relatively small group, I guess we, we're good for people to, to jump in and ask questions um, at whatever stage seems appropriate. Yep, that sounds great. So I promise it will not feel like an interrogation, no more so <laughs> than our usual meetings do. Um, and, you know, really, it is such a big opportunity to sit back and reflect at this stage in project development um, about what it means to actually enact and live the principles and values that you've espoused uh, in the organizational infrastructure that you're putting together for Koki. So um, I'm really, really looking forward to this session. And you know, this is, it, it is a pleasure to be able to be here and do this with you. Um, one of the things that I will divulge at the beginning is that I am actively working with the Koki team right now on some transition work and on uh, some of its uh, work with community engagement and governance. So I have kind of a cheat sheet in the back of my own head uh, about some of the things that, that Cameron and his uh, crew have been up to over the last couple of years, really uh, moving into position to be able to make some of the shifts that they're making. But so Cameron, a lot of our work together so far, uh, particularly on Koki, has been to think about how to, how to build a really strong foundation for Koki um, itself. And, in order for this group to really understand that, it'd be helpful to start with an overview of what Koki is and what it what it is trying to do. What's what's its relevance to JROST and what are, what is it that you're really trying to accomplish with Koki? Yeah, um, and this is a story which which keeps evolving over time as well. So Koki stands for the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative. Um, it, it's a project that really grew out of the intersection of three people's passions and excitement. Um, myself, um, as many of you know, I've, I've been interested in really understanding how well we're doing on the implementation of open practice, um, particularly in universities. I guess that's the more recent thing. Really understand how universities are doing um, with respect to open access, open data, and, and, and general really broader issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. My colleague, Lucy Montgomery, had this insight about four years ago that far from many of the senior-ish and senior people in universities not wanting to make a move um, or not wanting to push things forward, that many people felt like they were constrained, in fact, that everyone feels like they're constrained. And that um, if we could give them an excuse, if we could give them the reason to be able to change and shift what they were doing, um, that they really might be able to start making a difference within institutions. And this finally coincided with a new Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research who was looking for strategic projects and in an, in an event which has never happened in my life and I never expect to happen ever again, he was going around the university looking for new things that would be part of you know, his tenure and um, what he was looking for. And, and Chris is not a person who's drunk the open Kool-Aid. He's not a, an enthusiast about open access, but he's an enthusiast for the university and what it could be doing in society. And he's an enthusiast um, for shifting, really shifting the needle on um, equity and inclusion in the university. Um, and everyone said, oh, you go and ask him for 40 grand, ask him for a, a small grant to get something started. And he said, just tell me what you need. And we did, um, and he's given us $2 million over the last few years to build up a project which is really about putting universities and the academy back in control 
of the strategic information that we use to make decisions. Um, so at the kind of crude level, this is, how are we doing on open access? Where are we publishing? Um, what kinds of performance are we getting out of some of those different publishers and systems and infrastructures we're engaging with? Um, but at a broader level, really trying to understand how a university's turnover, its outputs, its, its inputs, its people, um, are engaged in knowledge making with society. Um, and the goal fundamentally is to try and provide an alternative to the uh, corporate systems which guide and control our decisions. Um, and to put that sort of data and information and infrastructure systems back in the hands of university leadership, academic communities. So ultimately we can make decisions about how we judge our own work. Um, in practice, that means we built up a large data set um, and started to be able to do analysis on a scale which is you know, significant, um, really to understand globally what's happening with open access, what's happening with open knowledge practices, um, but also starting to look at things like, you know, what are the number of, um, you know, how many women are there in senior academic positions, those kinds of things. So we're gathering this large data set. Um, and now we really have to turn that into a community asset. Um, it's a tool, um, it's an exciting research tool for us, um, but it's real value will come from when it's something that a broad community feels engaged in curating um, and building and ultimately supporting. So we're right at that stage as well of going from, you know, that initial very generous seed funding um, to thinking about how do we make this work in practice for the long term? Um, and how do we, again, put that in the control of a membership um, or a community that's interested in these things? That's super. So thinking about the, uh, the balance of the components that you're building, um, one of the things that you just said was that, you know, we one of the big aims of Koki is really to put the university back in control over its own understanding of itself. Um, there are technical components to that. And then there are also data, you know, kind of content components to that. Can you talk a little bit about the balancing act that you've played in terms of where you've expended the 2 million plus to date to support the, uh, the infrastructure that you're building? Yeah, um, well, like with, you know, any significant project, um, it, the vast amount of the money gets spent on people. Um, so it's people doing the work of, you know, in the first instance, gathering the data together, uh, trying to integrate it and build, build the systems um, that will we'll gather it together. There's a bit of money being spent on technology and compute we have. Uh, we spend a not trivial amount of money on moving data around. Our total data sets getting on for 80 terabytes, a uh, couple of 100 million, maybe a billion lines of database tables. Um, so it's not trivial in terms of that compute so side, but really the vast majority of the money has been spent on people working on gathering the data, um, the systems for managing that data and, and making it useful. Um, and then um, the demonstration of what we can do with that, with that information. Um, so I think we've been very focused. We spent a lot of time on that data gathering and data infrastructure. Um, and we've also got to spend more time now, I think on really figuring out how people want to use that information, what forms it's, it's useful in, um, but also we're seeing the gaps, right? We still, we, we think we're doing better than most other um, sources of, for instance, bibliographic information, um, drawing a bunch of things together. Um, but Africa is still largely missing. Um, we know we've got huge gaps there. Um, Southeast Asia, similarly, is not well represented for complicated reasons around the way that data is collected. Um, and you know, we have very little on China, very little um, in the surreal sphere as well. So, so those are things that need, need more work, but it's a question of choosing which of those things you focus on at any given point in time um, and navigating through that. Yeah, some of the big questions for the next six months. 
So you've made some of those choices in some of the ways that you've also invested in bringing in particular community members early in your development work. Can you talk a little bit about some of the events that you've hosted and some of the purpose, how those events and that engagement at an early stage is intentionally aimed towards some community engagement longer term? Yeah, and and this is really one of the tensions, um, right? So we... We wanted to be intentional about building community. Um, and maybe the sort of first point of call would have been to have a completely open um, call um, for some of those meetings. But we decided against that because, because we wanted to be intentional and because we wanted to try and reach out more broadly. So um, I guess there've been three meetings um, that we've had over the course of the project. Um, the first was a book sprint um, where we developed the ideas around the urban knowledge institution concept. Um, and that was a very carefully chosen group of people to try and bring expertise across a broad range of areas together. Um, but it was, if I'm honest, a very white Western group. Um, and that if we were starting from a particular place and wanted to bring sort of a particular set of expertise together. The next meeting that we ran, um, we actually ran, Curtin has a campus in Mauritius, um, which was a fabulous place to have a meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the beaches, the bars, the, the mountain, the scenery. Um, but it was also critically importantly, a place where we knew people from Africa could get to. Um, without having many of the visa problems um, that people, uh, that you know, African colleagues will have coming to Europe or to North America, um, or indeed the economic problems they have getting to, to South America, um, even because that's, you have to go the long way around. So we focused there really on, um, on an African context um, and try to understand the needs of um, African stakeholders um, or a subset of African stakeholders at least, in, in this context. And that we learned a lot from that around things not to do, um, you know, not to do things that wouldn't survive, not to do things where their access was based on charity. You know, it was really the message was very strongly. We want, a, we want a genuine place at the table and you have to organize the finances and the management of this so that our place at the table is, is genuine um, while not pricing us out. And that's, you know, still ringing in my ears um, 18 months, two years later. Um, and then we come to 2020. Um, so we were planning a meeting. Uh, and it was the first big meeting where we were going to get together the people who we thought of as those who would make the first sort of financial contributions um, to underpinning this. And this was when we were planning back in 2019. And there we again had a, a tough choice. Um, we want to engage a global community. We want the resources we're building um, to be global. Um, but the reality is the money is not global. Um, and so how do we manage that? And it's again, it's a it's a it's a, a tension or an issue we have to we have to continue to work through. Um, and the best I think we can do is, is remain cognizant of it. So that meeting was intended to be, um, broadly speaking, quite North American focused um, with Europe, perhaps more UK um, groups, uh, heads of library consortia um, as a sort of stepping stone towards understanding um, what kind of financial models could work, what kind of systems uh, might be appropriate. We were gonna hold that meeting in Aberdeen um, in July, 2020. Obviously, we didn't, <laughs> um, because no one's been holding any meetings this year. Um, and so we shifted to a pretty radically online, a little bit like actually this, this meeting, um, different time zones, um, staggered activities, um, different groups, trying to mix the groups up as much as possible by selecting the times correctly. Um, and I guess what we learned from that in retrospect because we'd moved online, we could have had more people involved um, uh, than we thought we could have in an in-person meeting. And that was the sort of the trade-off. And again, I think going into 2021, whether we're meeting online or in person, 
that question of thinking about the numbers um, is really is really key. Um, so so how do we yeah think about intentionally building community that's deliberately reaching out to new people um, while not excluding um, people and scaling a conversation um, around that and seeing 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 Peter's question and the answer is yes um, but. <laughs> Yeah, what's the band? Where's the bandwidth to hold all of the different conversations you'd want to be having, um, and and how does that relate to the actual resourcing question? So, I always reminded of something um, uh, Harry Collins wrote about um, book um, Why Democracies Need Science. His point is not that science is a great way to make decisions necessarily, or always makes the right decisions, but that it has in its aspiration the goal to make good decisions based on evidence. I think what's really important is keeping uh, the aspiration, even when we're not achieving them, keeping those guide stars in place so that we're challenging ourselves to do better each time we have one of these conversations. I love thinking of that as you know, building a, a good foundation, which I think is part of what you've striven to do in these first three meetings um, with some of the choices that you have made, including especially the Mauritius meeting. Um, when you think about, and, and here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not shift our attention entirely to it, but I do want to put the cards on the table that one of the things that um, will guide some of this conversation is work that Educopia has been doing uh, on values and principles that builds on you know historical work that Cameron and Jennifer Lynn and lots of others uh, have been doing, Bianca has been doing. Um, and what we have put together is a framework and an assessment checklist that start to take and uh, make measurable um, the, the ways that organizations and communities do or don't align with some of those values and principles that we have uh, specified out in so many different places, including maybe most recently the Spark and Core uh, uh, work from last year. So that checklist for anybody who's interested there, th this is still early beta. Um, so let me say that very frankly. Um, but I'm popping a link to, and I should have put the DOI, but <laughs> popping a link to the assessment checklist uh, where it's hosted on PubHub's Commonplace. And we're still gathering a lot of information about this, but what we tried to do was break things down into um, some of the main categories that values and principles documentation within our field have focused on. Um, and, and really dig into some of the questions that could help to evidence investments that are being made in uh, adhering to those values and principles. So I thought, Cameron, that it would be interesting at the least and maybe a little bit of fun to, to take a moment to really look maybe at diversity, equity, and inclusion as one of those and I'll let you just talk about some of the things structurally that you're starting to put in place as you're thinking about this shift from project to ongoing organization and hub for global activity. You know, as you think about what, you know, not, not only what you have already done, but also what you are planning to do over the next say two to three years, um, what are some of the places where you're making investments in diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of the governance uh, and, and value that Kogi brings? Yeah, um, really good question. And I mean, let me start with the sort of, you know, the cards on the table that our staffing isn't as diverse as it could be. I mean, we've got, a, we've got not a bad gender balance. Um, we have some people who are not not white European in the team, um, but but not many. Um, we don't have much linguistic diversity, um, though we're actually working on that. Um, I guess we do cover, I think it's seven or eight languages between us, but that's in a team of ten. Um, you kind of hope those numbers would be higher. Um, so that's that's clearly something we've got to work on. And uh, I think the university actually one of the good things about being in the university. Um, is there are policies um, and systems in place intended to help, not always as successful as we might like, but there's, you know, there's some serious um, effort at the university level also to keep 
people accountable to those kinds of um, rules. But, but as a fairly technical um, project, um, we do tend to um, and have not done enough work yet on um, getting beyond the usual kinds of suspects for that kind of work. Um, we've also thought pretty hard around where we're focused at a research level um, and at a, uh, I guess, aspirational target level. I think the thing that's important to us um, for the project is this geographic inclusion. Um, and, you know, particularly I've had a long-term um, interest in supporting the visibility of, of African research in uh, Northern Atlantic systems. Um, so, you know, we're keen to work in that space um, and to figure out how to work in that space. Um, again, you know, it doesn't do anyone any good if we get a big grant from a big philanthropy and parachute in with yet another system which is poorly supported and not really built for the local context. Um, so we've been working, um, one of the things we've been working on is building that network, building that contact list of people um, in particular places in Africa. And at the moment, it's primarily Anglophone um, Africa. Um, but with the idea of building um, the kinds of systems uh, with people to solve their problems. And, and some of those things are quite challenging. Um, so, you know, as many of you will know, I'm not a great fan of university rankings. Um, but a lot of people in Africa quite like university rankings because they're an outside measure with a measure of objectivity, which helps them to deal with some of the, the issues of nepotism and corruption that are still you know, substantial post-colonial um, or colonial, I should say, legacies um, in some of those places. So they really look for that external, uh, international um, quality measures, they use those words. So how can we work with people to give them information which serves those needs, but also um, we're comfortable with being, with being accurate. And then there's the whole, you know, we're, our technology is cloud-based. Um, so, you know, open infrastructure principles, uh, we're hosting that stuff on Google Cloud at the moment, and I'll have to justify that decision, but, it's, but it was a decision. Um, but that's just untenable in terms of, handing over a working system um, to a community in the African context at the moment. Um, the systems, the networks, the infrastructure, the power um, are just not there in many places. So we've got to really think hard about, about that um, in the future. Um, but then it gets overwhelming, right? So you've got to choose um, to some extent where you're, where you're going to be focusing. Um, and so I think, yeah, we are focused on that geographic question, particularly focused on, on Africa as a challenging use case. And then on the, the research and data side, we have two other sort of really focus areas that come out of the research interests of the group in part. Um, so one of those is gender and gender equity. Um, and I know that that can sometimes sound a bit disappointing to people as we, you know, concerned about, um, uh, broader issues and, and intersectional issues with equity and diversity and inclusion. One of the advantages of looking at gender as an equity issue in the higher education sector is A, we're clearly not done yet because there's lots of work, <laughs> not as though we're in a great state, um, but also the numbers are there. So we can do real high quality statistical analysis in a way that's really hard um, for those underrepresented groups that are, that are, that are, not simply not there in, in numbers that um, can help us address at a, at a data level. And then on the flip side, we've got a quite close focus on uh, Indigenous issues, partly coming from Australia, where there's a, a substantial legacy um, of, well, colonialism, misappropriation, um, and most re recently blowing up um, people's sacred sites so that we can mine them. Um, but also because the university, again, is taking this as a serious, on as a serious issue. So from a research perspective, we're starting to dig into that, um, that quite seriously. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and, and again, I don't think we're yet, it's particularly on the indigenous side, we're certainly not yet um, 
you know, really engaging those communities um, as broadly as we should be in, in, in setting that work out. So there's a lot to be done there as well. Um, but it is a question of, you know, where can we focus our attention? Um, and increasingly, how can we help other people? Um, so what are the tools and systems that, you know, as we intentionally stop trying to do everything ourselves, hand the tools and the systems over to other people um, so that they can have more capacity to do some of this work as well. That's one of the most radical things I think about the structure of Koki is the degree to which you've thought about it in a decentralized and open source kind of context, um, which really comes back to a lot of the way that you think about open knowledge as well. And the book sprint that you mentioned earlier, um, the book will be coming out from MIT Press later in uh, 2021, hopefully early 2021. Um, on open knowledge and kind of what what that could be. Can you talk just a little bit about your vision for what that is? Because I, I do think that, that that's a driving force in how Koki itself is structured. Um, that's, that's worth talking about for a moment. Yeah, um, and it's an irony that we've been pitched against the funder session because the, in some senses, the root of this, and again, you know, many of you were fellow travelers on this, on this road, um, where we, you know, argued for funders to make policy and for funders to implement things because once the funders said something was going to happen, it was clearly going to happen. And, you know, some success, I've been mean, a lot of success, but also, you know, disappointing in the question of culture change, I suppose, um, for many of us. Um, in some sense, how little difference that's made. It was why my attention shifted to universities as places where incentives for individuals in the knowledge production system really um, hit the road. Um, so the concept of the book, and we got the proofs this morning. <laughs> the proofs have the proofs have arrived. Um, you didn't uh, tell so, me that earlier. That's great. <laughs> I, I forgot. I actually forgot about that either. Um, so they were. It's it, you know, it's been a rough year for everyone. We're, we're a bit behind schedule on the book, um, but it will be out with MIT Press uh, hopefully early in the next in the new year, so February March. Um, open access, of course. Um, the book and the book sprint was an amazing process. We started with this notion of that there was something here about the university as an institution um, and um, the institutions are important. Um, the, the, we put too much on individuals to do things. Um, and we, we, we put too much on in incentives for individuals to do something, to do things. And we felt um, going into the book sprint, there was something about the way in which um, institutions create space for people to do the things that they really already knew they ought to be doing. Um, and I think that was what we, all we really had um, going, into the, going into the book sprint itself. What came out of the book sprint um, was this really rich notion of how institutions um, can be the underpinnings of knowledge creation. And universities are a particular example of this. They don't have to be the only example, um, of course, but we want to also focus on some pragmatics. So what does this really come out as? What we felt was that what seems to be emerging in general terms is that knowledge happens when groups come into contact, when groups negotiate a shared view of how the world looks like or a shared way of thinking about, about problems. Um, and so then sort of in the book sprint and then beyond, we asked ourselves, you know, what does it look like to provide an institution that supports um, that process of groups um, coming together, um, of them being able to interact productively in that creating knowledge. The first, you know, the nice thing about this or the thing that I thought was, was made me happy when it fell out of this naturally is diversity of the first order principle. Um, diversity of groups is absolutely a first order principle in knowledge making. Um, that's why we do peer review. It's why you need to talk to patients. Um, it's why we need to think about all of the people affected by policy making decisions in terms of in, in involved in those processes of decision making. Um, 
but diversity in itself is not enough. You need what we call coordination, um, and that it, it, I, with that coordination isn't a long way from the kind of things um, Catherine Fitzpatrick talks about in her book Generous Thinking, in terms of modes of acting, of being um, that draw the best out of interactions. Um, and you know, what does that look like? For us at the institutional level is systems of coordination, systems of ways of working together that make what a risky interaction safe. So open source is an institution, um, is a way of working, is a way of a set of templates, a set of patterns um, where we can work more productively together. And the amount of effort we put into making those systems and templates productive um, determines what we get out of it. Um, technology transfer offices are another example of this um, in terms of um, in terms of a set of systems. I mean, even non-disclosure agreements. Non-disclosure agreements are about creating a safe space to have a difficult conversation. Um, they're an institution, a system, a template, a way of ruling out certain kinds of conflict to enable you to really focus on the piece of the conflict, the piece of the negotiation that's really important. Um, so diversity, coordination, and then the third is communication, and I won't belabor that because I think yeah, this group <laughs> gets why communication is important and what its role is in knowledge making. Um, what does that mean for the project? It's meant a couple of insights. It's meant, um, and it's been a slow process with the university, as you might expect, negotiating that, you know, this has to be open source, that we have to go through this process of engaging with a community that, yes, I know you put in $2 million, but we actually plan to give most of the, the value away. Um, and we'll get more credit for that as a university, so that's okay, because you know, we're not going to win in the rankings, so let's create new rankings where we, where, where we look good. And that, that argument's starting, starting to play out. Um, but in terms of the sort of the scalability of the project, um, what I've realized what we've collectively come to realize is there's a real, bluntly a commercial advantage here. Um, the data we're talking about, the data that reflects the acts of research, the practice of research, the communication and the interactions with that research, it's huge, it's mammoth. Um, and again, you know, you guys work with stuff from Scopus and Web of Science and Microsoft Academic and Google Scholar day in, day out. And you know the data is not great <laughs> because there's a lot of it. It's really hard to keep straight. Um, and if you're a commercial operation selling the data, then you've got to keep your curation management. That's special source. That's the secret source you're selling. But if we can scale out the way the community organizers, curates, managers and use that data, then the value and the quality of the data is much higher. Um, the quality of information resources is much higher. But it's also cheaper. Um, it's also easier to do. So that's, I mean, I guess that's been at the heart of really trying to think, how do we take what's, you know, pretty highfalutin theory stuff and, you know, what does that actually mean about our project? And I certainly wouldn't claim we're doing it perfectly and you know, all the usual tensions about money and what we can give away and whose permission we need and, and what the rules are and, um, and yeah, the realities of having less time than you'd like. Um, they're all real. Um, but I think what keeps us going in a very real sense is the fact that if we can achieve the kind of critical mass that we imagine, if we can build the coordination that brings diverse groups into the process of knowledge making about this particular thing, um, about this particular set of concerns, um, then that becomes not just scalable and really valuable, but it doesn't actually have to cost that much to do in the scheme of things compared to what we're paying for it or similar kinds of things um, in the world at the moment. So it's a radical ask of universities to band together, even as you know, semi-collaborative institutional forms, which they are. Um, and this kind of comes back to Micah's question in the chat of, you know, how how do you how do you convince upper administrators 
to make the jump towards openness and uh, transparency that you are making? And how do you how do you make the argument that that actually is going to lead to that better, cleaner, cheaper? Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 hard. Um, it's a communications problem. Um, so part of the reality is realizing that you're working or trying to communicate to different people with different passions and interests. Um, so at one level, you've got you know that set of um, university leaders, um, library directors, deans, provosts who really get it, who are really reaching for the information they know they need already. Um, and then you've got a whole, um, you know, the majority of the university leadership of heads of schools of academics who are not unsympathetic, they're just busy um, and they're worried about something else. Um, part of, I mean, if the pandemic can be said to have a silver lining, um, part of it is that it's opened up people's awareness that actually many of these are the same problems. So at, at our university, which had this you know, real commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and wasn't really interested in open access um, or, or data sharing, as we started to connect those things together, you're starting to really see um, the senior leadership get, get a sense of why those things might be connected together and what it means and actually how it makes it harder when you've got to be transparent about issues and data collection which traditionally have been have been, have been hidden and, 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 um, and it's easy it's easier to keep these things under the rug um, like with defense research or those kinds of things um, the, the there's, so there's there's kind of a couple of different ways of selling it. One is to find find the people who already care, right? Find the people who are already engaged, who already want to know about it, and then work with the real enthusiasts. We've done a bit, you know, done a bit of that. We've identified some of those people um, and worked closely with them, and look forward to working more closely with them. Um, those people tend not to be presidents and vice chancellors. They tend to be provosts, DVCs, deans. Um, so the really the next step is really to craft um, more of the kinds of tools and information that they can pass up the chain and that is coherent with the 30, 40 page report that the person one down the chain is going to need to actually do implementation work. So trying to think about what that looks like in terms of, you know, there's a three slide deck that goes to the president. Um, if it's more than three sides, you've lost their attention. Um, it's going to have a recommendation. Um, that recommendation is actually going to be broken down into five things, which the, the dean or the provost or the deputy vice chancellor is, is focused on. But then there's a like 40 page report under that um, that helps the repository manager or the person in HR or the, the library director to understand where they are and what they can and can't do. Um, so I think there's, I mean, there's lots more work to be done here. Um, a lot of it comes down to slogans. And I still, I will come back to the slogan um, Sage Chowdhury had, um, but he tells us, tells me he got it from somewhere else, um, but I'm gonna credit him with it. So I think it's a genius piece of, um, of, of marketing communications, which is um, there is no industry that can survive if it is not, in control of its supply chain. Um, we are an information industry and we are not in charge of our information supply chain. So maybe once we've sorted out the toilet paper um, and, and figured out that actually you know, that's a serious problem um, and, and it's emblematic of a whole number of other series of problems around not being aware of this, the way in which resources and tools come in um, to the university, that information resources is a big part of that. Um, and so we need to take control of our supply chain. If we're going to survive, and survival is not a given anymore, right. not this year. <laughs> yep. 
Absolutely. So I've almost broken my promise to all of you. We've got five minutes left and I want to make sure that we can turn to uh, more of your questions. I at least invoked uh, Micah's and I think we touched a little bit on Peter's earlier. Um, additional questions or uh, is there a question in the chat that you already want to address? Anyone? I'm not seeing a bunch of names on the screen that are traditionally shy. Which is totally fine. So if anybody does, pop it into the chat um, and I'll stop talking as soon as I see something there. But I'll go ahead and go back to Peter's question because I think it's actually a good capstone question. Um, you know, how can a bunch of humanists, and I think this is part of what you were addressing just now with the higher administration, how we keep moving the, the advocacy language up. But how can a bunch of humanists and a bunch of data scientists work together to solve this problem? Um, I think we started. What, what kinds of skills are they bringing to the table? Uh, well, it's really, it's hard to know where to start. Um, the, really the, the, the thing that, with that's been let me start with an anecdote so Richard Hosky um our um our tech lead um about uh, about nine to twelve months after he was involved in the project came around and said came around and said I'm gonna have to write up the way um you guys interact with the questions we ask because the scientists just say what they want and we build it and that's okay um, you guys just keep asking questions <laughs> and they're not the questions I'm used to. Um, so I guess the, the, the really broad answer is the skills, the, 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 the capacity that we need are people to be able to really engage with questions um, and often questions in ways that they may not have been used to, to dealing with. Um, our, we're really struggling in the core team to, to figure out how to divide up roles and divide up um, because everyone's been across so many different things. Um, and that's actually, that's another scaling challenge is figuring out how to manage that. Um, but I would say, and maybe this, this is the sort of the bigger, the bigger thing, and again, it fits back into the whole knowledge of open knowledge institutions. Um, it's not just about asking questions it's about listening to questions that are being asked um, and again to go a bit humanist about it to really listen to the questions that the systems are posing um, or implicitly asking and sometimes explicitly asking so really but really being sensitive to that and then I think the thing that we've got quite good at is really cycling between the ways of framing the questions, the ways of reframing questions, the ways of really thinking hard about what the question's really asking, and then flipping back to that science mode, that data-driven mode of, okay, now we've got a way of framing and defining this question. Can we rigorously answer it? Um, and the answer to that's often no, um, but we can take a pass at some slice of it or some piece of it. And then we have to go back around the cycle. You know, given that we were able to answer this question that way, what did we miss? Um, so that's a very probably high level vague answer, but I think it's really around better questions and better listening. 